treat. We have some wonderful, wonderful people here to present to you today. I know that many of you are accustomed to our superintendent of schools addressing you, and he will momentarily, but we have some surprise guests that are coming before you today to share some exciting information as we close out our Black History Month. So I want you to be attentive and you'll have an opportunity to ask questions, but I just want to set the tone and let you know that you are in for a treat. You are chosen for such a time as this to be a part of a historical moment, to share with an author who has served as a pioneer and paved the way for so many of us to be here today. So we're excited. On behalf of the school district, we thank you, all of our presenters, and we certainly thank you for being chosen by your superiors to be a part of the Student Advisory Council. This is our last one, and Dr. Beasley has a treat for you today as well for serving and being such uh, an engaged audience to help us promote a school district that's committed to high performance. So we thank you for that, and we want to applaud you on behalf of the school district. Many of you have received the agenda today. I would ask, because we are recording, that you silence your cell phones or any mobile devices. Yes, turn them down. I see them being passed. In addition to holding questions towards the end of every presentation, we will permit an opportunity, but if you would just hold any pertinent questions that you have towards the end, we would appreciate that. In addition to participating in a survey at the end, we'll come back with more details in regards to that, but we again we welcome you and we thank you for being here today. Without further delay, I would like to introduce to you our superintendent of schools who will come and address you and then we will resume with the program as printed.
to live and to live at the level of quality that we would like to live. We may not agree on how to live, but that's okay. That's what makes the world go around, doesn't it? We're different. And as young people, I want you to celebrate differences. Let people be who they are. You be who you are. But allow others to be who they are and who they desire to be. And if you respect that, if you take that approach to life, you will be amazed. You know, sometimes people think you got to keep one group down in order to lift up another. We keep one group down so we can have this. And, but guess what? As long as you hold somebody else, else down, how I many you know you hold yourself down? Right. Oh, yeah, that's just the law of physics. If you keep holding someone down, you can't go anywhere yourself. In order to free yourself, what do you have to do? You got to free, free, free them. And just remember that. Just remember that. I would say in America, we got to get every group being successful. Because we only have about 320 million people here in America. Write that number down, 320 million. Just put 320M, 320 million. China has 1.2 billion. India has 1.1 or so billion. They got more people on their honor roll <laughs> than we have in our whole country. So we're not in a position as a country for one group to be successful and all the other groups to not be successful. Because we're competing against very large countries. And again, they got 10% on their honor roll is probably half of our population. Is that so why does it make any sense for one group to have rights and another group not to have rights, and then we have an inequity of wealth, inequity of opportunity, inequity of uh, resources, etc. And then we think we're going to be competitive at the global level. It's not going to happen. See, the world as it existed 200 years ago, it no longer exists. And so we're more interconnected, we're more global, and so there's what we call global competition. And don't let the, what you, everything you see on television fool you. There are some countries that have a higher GPD, gross national product, than we do. There are some countries where uh, their wealth is a whole lot higher than our wealth. There are some countries, they, they're not called the United States of America, there are many cities in those countries, they have more technology than we have in our cities here in America. You know why? Because the world has changed. So while we value being the greatest country on the earth, we need to make sure we remain competitive. We need to ensure that all of our people are successful. We need to ensure that everybody has a right to this American dream. And you'll hear from Joan today how she contributed to that. We are here today. I am a superintendent in Clayton County because of her efforts. Oh, you don't realize how connected it is. You are here today in this auditorium because of her efforts. Our country has changed for the better. We got a ways to go, but it has changed for the better. We're better today than we were 50 years ago. But it has changed for the better because of her efforts and those of the individuals who walked in and worked with her. And so I want to encourage you to listen to her, give her your undivided attention. You give her the highest level of respect that you can give her because she is going to share, share her role, her story. But as, she, as you listen to her role and her story, I want you to be thinking about your story because there's still a fight that has to occur. There are still individuals that are being marginalized. There are still groups that need someone to stand up for them. That, that need to stand up to the powers that be and say, no, that is not right. And there are some very powerful people, but one thing I've learned, I mean, you kept up with the Delta situation and with our school system. That's an example of standing up for what's right. Where some people like to stand up for money, but some people like to stand up for a moral cause, for what's right. Our school system stood up for what was right. It was a moral cause, it still is. You can see what's happening if you've been paying attention to the news, that 
They were going to vote. The House of Representatives at the state capitol voted to support the bill, even though we got a solution, and we were okay with them supporting the bill. But when Delta decided to come out against the NRA, the National Rifle Association, down the state senator saying, we won't support Delta. So they were okay with Delta as long as they were coming and taking money away from the children. But now you're going to stand up and support and come against the bill because you're taking money away from the NRA. Come on, get there. See, I, let me tell you why I'm sharing that with you, because if you all don't see that your education is important, you won't get it. You won't get it. If you don't see how voting is important, you don't get it. I just believe that children should always be lifted higher and given consideration above guns and rifles. That is my position, and everybody know it. I don't care if it's being on camera, that is just my position. I Listen, I believe in gun rights. All of us may have one. That's our constitutional right. But I also believe that you gotta balance right with responsibilities. And if you can't balance rights with responsibilities, then you really are not you're really not qualified for the rights. We all have a right to do. I have a right to drive a car. You will one day. But I also have a responsibility not to drink in what? I have a responsibility to stop at a red light, don't I? I have a responsibility not to drive through a stop sign. I have a responsibility to not text in what? I have a responsibility that when a pedestrian is crossing the road to slow down so I don't kill someone, right? So yes, I have a right, but it seems to me that I need to make sure my right to drive is balanced with my responsibilities. And if we're not willing to balance our rights with our responsibilities, truth be told, and this is Dr. Beasley, you really don't deserve the right. And so I want to encourage you to listen to Joan. Think about your rights. Extend rights to others. But most importantly, think about your responsibilities. We have a responsibility to ourselves and to our neighbors, our families, to do what's right by all people. Not the ones who look like us. Not the ones who are in the same political party like us. You have a right, a moral right, a universal moral obligation to do right by what? All, All people. And so we've got to we've got to grow in our in our country a little bit more, in our state a little bit more, because it's time that we focus on our responsibilities and balance our rights with that of our responsibilities. So let's give our program. Uh, participants the opportunity to come and keep us flowing and I'll come back and I'll say more and entertain your questions as this will be our last student advisory for this year. So thank you all for being here on today and I look forward to the Q&A after we get through with our presenter. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. So next on the agenda we have Ms. Regina Wallace, our coordinator of social studies and the young lady who is responsible for our wonderful, wonderful guest speaker today. And she will introduce our guest speaker. So I give to you, Ms. Regina Wall. Good morning. Today is February 28, 2018. And as Dr. Beasley stated, today is the last day of Black History Month. And during this month, your teachers have exposed you to field trips, lessons, historical people, historical events, all centered around black history, and today will be no different. The Living Legends program was started last year as a culminating event in honor of Black History Month. The purpose of the program is to honor legends who have contributed to black history and who are still contributing to the community and to the legacy of African Americans. Last year, the Department of Social Studies honored Dr. Terrence Roberts, one of the original Little Rock Nine members. Who was he? 
They were very instrumental in integrating public schools in the South. They brought awareness to what was going on as far as segregation. And their story made it all the way to President Eisenhower and federal legislation against segregation followed their um, protest. We also honored Dr. Bernard Lafayette. He was an original freedom writer who also brought awareness to segregation in the South and public places. What the Freedom Riders did would also ultimately lead to federal legislation against segregation of public spaces in the South. And today, we have Ms. Joan Trumpower Mahalan. She is the recipient of the 2015 National Civil Rights Museum Freedom Award, is a civil rights legend who has participated in over 50 sit-ins and demonstrations by the time she was 23 years old. She was a freedom writer and a participant in the Jackson Woolworth sit-ins and helped plan and organize the March on Washington. She has received numerous awards and recognitions for her work in the civil rights movement. Most recently, she was recognized with, along with other freedom writers by President Barack Obama. She has appeared in several books, including Coming of Age in Mississippi, Breach of Peace, We Shall Not Be Moved, and the new illustrated kids book about her life, She Stood for Freedom, which you all will get a copy of today. She has appeared on television and news programs like CBS Nightly News, and her story and experiences have been highlighted in the award-winning documentary, such as An Ordinary Hero, PBS's Freedom Riders, Standing on My Sister's Shoulders, and the groundbreaking film, Eyes on the Prize. She is a sought after speaker, having presented at major universities, charitable events, government organizations, the U.S. Congressional Luncheon, and the United Nations. And guess what? She is here in Clayton County Public Schools. <laughs>
why I have to go to the colored water fountain. Um, in Seattle, I can remember white ladies and colored women bathrooms. Uh, you had, you could not sit at Chris's uh, counters. We used to go out town and to buy candy or something. We couldn't sit at the counter. We couldn't even uh, go downtown and get to the London restaurants. Uh, downtown in DC. This area was supposedly equals, we were being treated that way, and I suddenly thought this white person, they had all kinds of things at their disposal to take to, to do me in, and there was nothing I could do about it. He said, um, you ran that light. My dad said, no sir, I didn't run the light, it was yellow. Mars, I said to you, you ran that light. My dad didn't say anything. And he looked at us in the back seat, and I guess we looked like a nice little family, and he said, um, Morris, you like good news, sir. So I'm gonna let you. I'm gonna let you off this time. Uh, it was a um, separate and unequal society, uh, basically buttressed by uh, local customs and laws. But the, you know, that was that was just the way things were. And you wanna go? What do you mean that's the way things were? I've had fights all over who had questions raised. I later met blacks who, when they had questions raised, their parents had to tell them, uh, it may be wrong, but don't you try to do anything about it. This is in God's hands. Uh, here's how you protect yourself. Maybe you shouldn't ride the bus so much if that upsets you. Your parents did that, but they also told you that it would come to an end. Because it was wrong. Anything that's done wrong, can't well, there I am at about the age of, oh, maybe 10. And when I was that age growing up, the high point of my year wasn't school. It was going to see Grandma and all the relatives down in Oconee, Georgia. And Oconee played a definitely big prominent event in my life. And you can see a little bit about that. Now, Oconee consisted of a dirt road with railroad tracks running down the middle. And this train would come tearing through twice a day and every house in town was chased. The name of the train was Nancy Hanks. Now, we'll start with the students. Who was Nancy Hanks? Y'all don't know, okay? The name of the train, but who was the lady? Nancy Hanks. Okay, you just don't know teachers? <laughs> Where's that superintendent of school? <laughs> <laughs> who was Nancy Hanks, sir? Nancy Hanks. Oh, you look at you cheat. You <laughs> Just got indoor plumbing at that time. Uh, indoor plumbing. 
then, then, then you know, it was just a pipe back to some well or something like that. You didn't drink the water because there would still be aquatic life that would come through when you turned on the tap. And this is, you know, how they lived. Uh, but my mom uh, is very significant in our, in our lives. It was this turning point in the family's history. So um, on a dare, my, my mom heads down this road with her friend into the black quarters of Oconee. And my mom sees the realities of segregation and separate but equal. And she says, this is wrong, and I'm gonna do something about it. My friend Mary, we were about 10 years old. We came to sent back this way into the black neighborhood and by these houses that were just shacks, the better word for it. Not an ounce of paint anywhere, just hard beaten shacks and folks just made themselves scarce and they saw these two little white girls coming down the road. Nobody wanted to be in a position to have done anything about us. And that impressed me. And then we came to the school, which was just a one-room shack with one outhouse, a pump, and the door was ajar even in the summer, and you could see this pot-bellied stove, I think it was in there, for heat. That was it. And that, in contrast to the new school for white kids, was just too much for me. And that's when I resolved that when I had the chance to do something to make things fair, I would take that chance. I couldn't have gone into any big philosophical thing on segregation or whatever, but I knew this was wrong and it had to change. And if I hadn't taken that walk, my life would have turned out so much different. So that was one of the best decisions I ever made.
and ran with it without telling the ladies. But they were, the ladies were down there the second day, you better believe it, in force. So really, it's woman power. <laughs> and don't you men forget it. <laughs> or you young men. Well, we got told Durham, where Duke was, was the second place to have sit-ins. And one night, our Presbyterian chaplain at our every Sunday evening meeting told us that some of the students from North Carolina College who were doing the sit-ins would be over next week and talk with us about it. But keep it quiet. Don't spread the word. The administration can lock us out of the building. The rowdies, like, you know, clan sort could show up and cause a problem. How many police could show up and arrest us? Well, these fine-looking folks came over. Oh, the guys were real fine. The ladies were very ladylike. And explained to us in legal and moral terms about sitting in at lunch counter. Now, you all may not know too much about lunch counter. Those are sort of passe. But this was before McDonald's took over the world, or Taco Bell and all these places. You went into a store, we call it a variety store, it's sort of like a dollar store, and you got your little cheap school supplies and toiletries and things. Your money was free over there. But when you went over to the lunch counter, where you could sit down and get a quick bite, quick and cheap bite to eat, your money wasn't green anymore. It was grounds for arrest. So the student said, if our money's good here, it's good there, and we're going to sit here and see you serve us. That was the sit in, that was the lunch counter. The place you sat down in the store to get cheap, quick food. Well, we had all this explained to us, legally like that, and morally like treat people the way you want to be treated. And then, lo and behold, these students from North Carolina College invited us to join them in the demonstrations, the sit-ins and picketing in front of these stores that wouldn't serve them, saying things like, don't buy where you, where you can't eat, things like that. So a bunch of us went to join them on the picket line and ultimately on the sit-in. But once we got arrested, oh, my dude was furious. How could a southern white girl do something like that? Well, I could do it because I was a southern white girl and wanted to make, help make the South, my part of the country, the best that it could be. I was there because I was a southern. And I was at Duke because I was white, so hey. Um, well, Duke and I did not get along. They thought we had lost our feeble minds. And I finished out my semester. I didn't lose credit for that semester. Got my grades. One of my professors, I said, well, if you give a pop quiz like you're known for, I may be in jail. They're talking about a demonstration. Can I take the pop quiz after I get out of jail? <laughs> she said, oh, no. I'll bring it down to the cell. You can't cheat in there. <laughs> he was sympathetic. We didn't get expelled because the professor's organization voted and pressured the administration not to kick us out of school. Um, but I dropped out after the semester was over. I wasn't going back to that place. Came back up to D.C. and continued demonstrating with college students. Am I supposed to say something else? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I don't have eyes in the back of my head, you know. It's hard to see that. Okay. So the students at North Carolina College, back, you know, before cell phones and everything, they asked me, if you're going back to D.C., go up to Howard University and find out what's happening. We haven't heard anything from them since our big organizational meeting, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, that was held at our spring break. Go up to Howard and see what they're doing. And if they're not doing anything, encourage them to get the show on the road. So I went up. I didn't quite know where Howard was. I was, you know, over across the river in Arlington, Virginia. But I found Howard.
and they were planning to sit in in Arlington. Well, that's my hometown, and I had experience. I've been arrested twice in sit-ins, so they welcomed me and invited me to join them. So here we are sitting in in Arlington. Those older guys, those are from the American Nazi Party. You see the one guy pointing right at Dion. You heard Dion talking about going to the library and all in Petersburg, where C.T. Vivian was from. And then the kid in the white little shirt, he was later killed in Vietnam. So he come up from junior high to see what was happening. And I don't know if he had anything ugly to say, but he went on to Vietnam. And his, his daughter, when she saw the picture on a local um, website in Arlington, identified the dad who told his daughter. She never knew her father. So now what, son? Oh, okay. There the three of us are now. And there's going to be a photo exhibit. I don't know that it will have it, you know, morphed into it. But with the three of us who were, well, actually four of us who were at that sit-in will be represented when they have the photo exhibit um, in the local library in June. Yeah, Dion is still bad. <laughs> <laughs> and the lady went on to become a physician. And I think he lives in Florida now. Well, in the summer of 61, next year, that's the year of the Freedom Rides. I think your congressman, John Will was the congressman here? Yeah. yeah. He was one of them Freedom Rides of sorts, you know. Still, still good to see him. Actually, today is the 58th anniversary of the first time he was arrested in prison. Y'all hear that? In Nashville. He went to bed. Well, the city, and I'll give my little rant on that in a minute. But Hank Thomas, the guy who's standing here in the white shirt, he was part of our DC City group. And following the teachings of Gandhi, if one falls and cannot continue, others step up and take their place. Well, the people on the original Freedom Ride. 13 that left D.C., they had been so badly beaten and inhaled so much smoke, they could not continue. So sit-in students from across the South came to keep the riots going. We were Dora Smith from Atlanta, um, Jerome Smith from New Orleans, our, um, our gang from D.C., and others. Oh, Charles Gerard, group from Richmond. He's down in Albany now. Um, we all came to keep things going. Now you mainly, if you want, hear about Diane Nash's group from Nashville. And yes, they were the first ones to get down there to keep the riots going. But in D.C., including Dion, we had a group that was just as quick to head south. Alabama as Nashville, but you know, this was before interstates, and Nashville was a whole lot closer to Birmingham than Washington, D.C., so they got there first, and they get all the credit. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever is the first gets the credit. But the total number of students in the city and group that came, D.C. is second only to Nashville, and Nashville had a huge group, hundreds of students. And we had a little small group. I don't think we ever had more than 50 or so. So percentage of our group, we got to be hands down. You all know about percentages and figuring out the percentage of the group. You can got that through that in math. Math is not my thing, but <laughs> sir. <laughs> but um, so DC, I think, there's more credit than you got. Look, you know, Diana was a friend. Bernard Lafayette, John Lewis, we're all friends, even if they are misrepresented in the press, I don't know what say. Well, there's, I got the jacket, there's my mug shop. <laughs> On the boy's shirt, my mom's an ex-con. <laughs> I 
I got a shirt like that. Mine says, this is my government issued ID. <laughs>
after they passed the bill. They don't have a freedom march to different places. It's just the Mississippi one's the most famous. So the last freedom march was to Auburn, Georgia. Every time I was arrested, I was threatened with a policeman putting his hand on a gun.
school for African American, well, we didn't use the term African Americans, and colored students. And um, I wanted to get a college degree that would be well recognized. So I applied to Blue, and they accepted me, in spite of the fact that my high school back in Virginia point blank refused to send my transcripts there. But Tupelo said, well, we'll accept you on your Duke transcripts alone. You, we don't need your high school ones. Your Duke transcripts are enough. So I got in, like I say. We got stayed in jail for the last minute, got out on bond. No, I didn't get out on bond. Paid the rest of the fine. Before the NAACP paid the rest of the fine. I didn't have any money and ended up back out of Tupelo, where I was. Did my best to be a regular student. Tell about the first night. Oh, he loves that story. <laughs> it's his favorite story on his mama. Well, I did meet Dr. King, walked across campus with him, you know, to get him to the next building. My first night, the word had not gone forth that there was a white girl on campus. <laughs> and I guess to save on electricity, they cut the lights down real low um, at night in the hallways. Uh, this was an old school that each room did not have its own bathroom. You had to go down in the middle of the hallway where there was a communal bathroom, shower room, all that. Well, Mother Nature called me in the middle of the night and I had on what we called a shorty back then. Some of the teachers may remember shorty. Little short nightgowns, very lightweight material. Not only was it lightweight material, but mine was sort of a pale pink, and I was even paler then because um, I'd been in jail all summer. <laughs> so I was tiptoeing down the hallway, and a girl from the other end of the hall had had a call from Mother Nature, and she was tiptoeing down, and she saw me, and she screamed bloody murder. <laughs> she thought she was seeing a ghost. <laughs> well, she startled me, and I screamed. But Mother Nature ran on out, and we both made it to the facilities in the middle of the hall. And I think by morning, everybody in the door knew there was a white girl. <laughs> well, at first, some of the students weren't sure about me. Was I just, you know, on my semester abroad type thing, checking them out? But as one meal who was still a good friend said, when I saw you studying every night in the library, just as hard as the rest of us, I knew you were okay. And when I came back the second year, I was in and got invited to play Delta Sigma Theta. Montgomery with the Freedom Riders, but they got around. And, um, 
this to them was the worst. Everyone believed that the, the students would be immediately arrested and carted off to jail. And so no one thought that that was going to cause much of a ruckus. They really had their hopes pinned on the integrated group of demonstrators um, outside the store, down the street. When the three individuals, uh, Perlina Lewis, Memphis Norman, and Ann Moody, sat down at the white counter, nothing happened. Now Joan, interestingly, was not supposed to be part of this demonstration. She was what was called a spotter, and she was supposed to spot the uh, demonstration, the protests going on down the street. But the picket line was arrested more or less immediately. This was lasting a while. So Lois and I phoned in a report on that, and um, then they would make uh, Medgar's office would know to get the lawyers and bonds money together. And then it was sort of like, okay, what do we do now? This was a block or so up the street. And um, we said, well, let's go check in what's happening in Woolworth. They had no idea that, that, that this environment had turned uh, volatile until they walked in the store. Joan sees all this and realizes, first of all, she is beginning to communicate with the, the demonstrator. She's, she sees a man with a knife walk by and she calls out, um, Annie, he's got a knife. Um, and all of a sudden she's identified with the people at the counter. Who's this white girl talking to those black girls, you know? So all of a sudden she realizes that she's in danger. But then I sat down. That's when I became a problem. She walked through that mob in the war store. And they realized, of course, immediately where she stood. She joins Perlita and Annie at the counter. The first white to join the demonstration. And at this, the crowd is just incensed. They become like hornets. They start screaming at her. Things are just going out of control. And at that point, Joan has said that she believed that they were not going to make it out alive. None of them were going to make it out alive. Okay. Now to go down in history. The back of your head. You see how they're sort of looking down at us? Well, the guy who took that picture, to me that is the true story, the important thing about that picture. Fred Blackwell, he was the same age as us college kids. He came in as a second string photographer, the first string guy who'd gone back to get his film developed all about film, you know, developed for the evening paper. And they sent in Fred. He had graduated from the same high school as the kids in the crowd. He knew a bunch of them, probably dated their older sister, hung out with their older brothers. The guy with the cigarette lived three doors down the street. These were Fred's people. He identified with them. He supported them as his friends. But he ended up, with permission from the store manager, standing on the counter for three hours, watching his friends and watching the nonviolent demonstrators. By the time it was all over, his sympathies had shifted to the nonviolent demonstrators. That is the power of Gandhi and nonviolence. That night when the picture appeared in the evening paper, a kid at a rival white high school saw the picture and his heart changed found that out over 50 years later when Mike O'Brien, the white guy who was talking, was doing a book talk in Northern Virginia. And this guy obviously knew a lot more about that picture and about the whole thing than Mike had said. You see the guy over here, the older guy with the panel, he's the local bootlegger. <laughs> this old man recognized the local bootlegger? Yeah. And um, it, it was curious. Now, to me, 
You've got to remember that the student takes the demonstration to the street, to the lunch counter, the lawyers take it to the court, but the press takes the story to the world. The power of the press. So if there's any press here, I have it all to you. And always, if you have a demonstration of some type or have an issue, remember the press takes the story to the world. Now our mistake that day, learn from our mistake. We had finished exams at the college. Excellent time for us to demonstrate. But it was exam week at the local high school just a couple blocks away. And after, for lunch, the kids who had finished their exam could come all uptown to the lunch counter and get their lunch. Except we were there and they were not happy. They, their big chance of the year to get to leave campus for lunch. And the counter was closed because of these crazy demonstrators. So always know what else is happening in town if you plan to be out there demonstrating. Now what, son? Ah, Medgar Evers. He was the first of the civil rights leaders to be assassinated before King, five years before King, before Malcolm. Medgar was NAACP's man in Mississippi. He was out to our campus a lot. He mentored a lot of the students in the state. He and John Salter, a white looking guy, older guy at the county, they had planned the demonstration together. And Megra had wanted to come down once he heard things got violent, John talked him out of it, because you'll be killed. But less than two weeks, about two weeks after our demonstration, Megger was shot dead in his driveway when he came home from a mass meeting. It was the night that President Kennedy went on national television to say we need the Civil Rights Act. Now young folks, remember we had three Candles back in the day, and they signed off the air after the late evening news. I see the motor heads nodding. So when the president went on national TV, the country came to a standstill. And that night, Megan was shot dead in his driveway with an armloaded t shirt saying, Jim Crow must go. The day that Megan was buried in Arlington National. Cemetery near my home. That was the day that President Kennedy sent the Civil Rights Bill up to Congress to the Hill, as we say. And the day that President Lyndon Johnson signed the bill into the law of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. That would have been Megan's 39th birthday. So you see that the cosmic connection between Major Everest and the Civil Rights Act of 64. Well, yeah, we had to march on morning, 63. And if I ask most people, what can you tell me about the Civil Rights Movement back in 1963? This is the one thing they know. Yes, sir? Okay. I got to project better. Okay. Wonderful day. But that's not the story of 1963. It was the one bright moment in a terrible year. You had fire hoses turned on the demonstrators in Danville, Virginia. You had fire hoses and police dogs on the students, grade school students even, in Birmingham, Alabama. You had our demonstration in Jackson. You had hundreds, if not thousands, of students in Jackson thrown into jail, well not into jail, into the cattle barns 
at the state fairgrounds in Jackson and fed from the trials where they put the food for the animals. You had the assassination of Major Evers. You had the March on Washington. Then you had, less, less than two weeks later, events in Birmingham again. And then you had the assassination of President Kennedy. 63 was not a good year. Let's see a little bit more of this. On September 15, 1963, tragedy would befall the most innocent of victims in the battle for racial equality when a bomb exploded at the 16th Street Baptist Church. We've all seen the footage of people getting sprayed by the water hoses and, and things like that. Well, that was the, pro the protests that were going on at that time, and they were essentially being staged at the 16th Street Baptist Church because it was a downtown church, and they could gather there and then leave from there for their protest. And that, so that's what was happening. Well, the Klan didn't like that, so what they did is they planted a bomb underneath the steps on the side of that church and it blew up at about 10.22 in the morning. In fact, the, these, these girls were getting ready. There was a youth service that morning. And in fact, the title of the lesson was called The Love That Forgives. And the, and the bomb blew up and killed those four girls. Time for sadness. There was nothing to celebrate. Glass that we picked up out of the gutters at the 16th Street Baptist Church. The day that three of the little girls who had been blown up there were buried. And the police shot over the heads of the people who came out of the church to disperse the mob, right? We attend the funeral, we were staying outside. And uh, we were going to follow the cartoons until uh, Ed King and uh, Diane Nash pointed to show us the um, National Guard standing with guns aimed down at us in the streets. The, the National Guard, who had been, who had been nationalized by the President of the United States, had rebel flags on their uniforms. Mm -hmm. And I was on this American flag, which was not liked. They just fell in love with the American flag recently in the South. And so the flag was a sign of resistance that I was holding. So you could see them standing all up around the guns drawn. We were on top of the church. Yeah, all around. I didn't look up at them. And so uh, Ed and Diane said, look, 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 look. The same way they did at Meg's funeral in Jackson when John Doerr came out and started screaming and yelling and said, uh, we must stop because it they are going to shoot you, pointing to the guns aimed at people in the streets down Ferris Street. It would have been like Charlotte Massacre. I'm not sure they were going to shoot us. Oh, we were standing. You're not sure? No. The church, you, you're talking about during the time the pillow was going on? Yes, ma'am. They just blow the church on the Remember that. People, one person says one thing and one says another. Both of them 
or tell him the truth. Well, we went on with the year, we got into voter registration more and more. This is the plan came up to have what we call Freedom Summer. Big voter registration, community organizing campaign. And encourage, recruit students from the north, knowing it would be mostly white students, to come down and help out in the voter registration. And early on, we knew that somebody was going to get killed. But, and we could tell them that, but they really would not understand that not all of you will go home. These three guys were killed. Now, Cheney and Werner were friends of a lot of us out of Tupelo. There were so many folks, civil rights folks, coming through Mississippi. They would come out to Tupelo to get some of their bearings, and we would take turns sort of telling them what you need to know, particularly if you're white. And I, by luck of the draw, I'm the one who would give Mickey and his wife Rita their orientation. And people have asked me many, and I was in a car about two weeks before that, that had been stopped on the road out near Canton after a mass meeting. It turns out they, they were planning to kill us to stop Freedom Summer. But they realized anybody here whose family is from India or Pakistan, luckily you all know. Two countries were not, well, they had wars. They both got independence from the British Empire, but they were not friendly on religious grounds. And the leader of the opposition party in the Indian parliament had been arrested like a few days before going to a restaurant in Jackson in support of blacks in Mississippi. And this did not go over well at the embassy in Washington, D.C. They had complained to the State Department, and they had passed the word on to local law enforcement and what have you in Mississippi powers of being, saying, leave the Indians alone. Well, Common in Pakistan is the driver in the car and they started beating him. And our captain, Ed King, had to, and everybody in the car was white. We had carefully planned that. You know, in the interest of safety, you do what you gotta do sometimes. Ed said, kept saying, don't hit him, he's from India. He's an Indian. And the guys eventually backed off. Well, Hamas was not happy he was Pakistani, and his country was close to a state of war with India, but it saved our lives, and we got out alive. They didn't stop Freedom Summer by killing us, but two or three weeks later, they killed our president, but it didn't stop Freedom Summer. So people say they feel guilty. No. I don't feel the least bit of guilt that I'm alive and they died. But I do feel a responsibility to do a little bit more because of them. They aren't here to, to speak to groups of students like you. So I'll, I'll do a little extra speaking. I'll do a little extra this and that for the people that can't do it because they didn't make it through. I guess that's all I got. Well, okay. I spoke to Black Lives Matter in the Arlington, at Washington Lee High School. And um, they opened it to the entire student body. And you can see they got a pretty diverse crowd. What else is a boy showing? That's it? Okay. Power to the people.
different Clayton County leadership who was responsible for getting us to that particular event. The Black Panther private movie screening would not have been possible without support from Ricky Clark, Clayton County City Manager, Sylvia Reddick, Morrow City Manager, and Dietrich Stanford, Clayton County COO. With those members of members of their office, please come forward.
in the system. So we're probably going to try to find you guys a replacement. I don't know if it just wasn't holding up well or, or how it is across the board. If you just like other things, but we're always evolving. We're always trying to find things that work for you guys. Second one was the Dutch waffle that looks like a funnel cake. Everyone loved it and everyone still loves it. So that will stay. That's one of those things that it seems like everybody really enjoys. So we're going to continue that. Um, it will continue on to your 18, 19 school year. So just to speak on some of the things that we're doing because we are always running. We get about well, a little over 100 samples in the office over a school year. And so we go in and we try the, the best of the best of them and then those get routed to you guys. So here's a couple things that we have tried and we're gonna bring to your schools for you guys to try and let us know if you like them or you don't. So the blueberry pancake and sausage on a stick by Jimmy Dean. It is turkey sausage and it is delicious. So if that is something that y'all like, definitely tell us whenever we go out for your school testing. Also the, uh, the peach biscuit is like a, um, anybody like peach cobbler? It is straight up like peach cobbler in a biscuit and it is delicious. And then um, the egg and cheese breadstick is something that we're looking at a replacement to the calzone that we're looking at. So we're gonna try that out, see what happens. That is also a turkey bacon product. So just so you know. All right, so fire roasted chicken panini. You've seen these on your, on, your rest, on your menus now too. And this is doing very well in the school. So apparently you guys agreed with them. And so it is just gonna, we're gonna continue that one with 1819 as well. Chicken tortilla soup. This was a recipe that was developed by our chef James, um, James Jabbar. Uh, he actually put that whole thing together. Uh, we are moving out of soup season, but we will be implementing that on the 1819. You guys loved it, we're gonna bring it to you. So that's one of those things where you guys directly influenced a recipe that we're gonna put on the menu. So ongoing entree tests. One of the big things that I've been hearing is that the pizza this year was eh, okay. Um, no one was really like super loving it, but pizza is one of people's favorites. So we wanted to do something different. So some of you guys have seen my face out there trying different pizzas. So you've got uh, Basil Boss, which is a personal pan pizza. That's a little different than the one that you're trying now. I think some of you guys have also tried our pizzas out there, the personal pan pizzas, and those are going over really well. And then we're looking for a replacement for some of our larger sliced pizzas, which aren't doing as well. Um, and then, um, how many people liked the wing day? You like wing day? So we're trying to replicate that on a regular basis. Um, so we have a, uh, it's a, a buffalo chicken wing uh, or drumstick so that we can bring on regularly. So that's something else that we're looking at and you'll look for that as well as a, a boneless buffalo wing. So we're gonna be looking at that as well. So you'll see those um, coming up. Here's your honey corn biscuit. We were gonna use that as a side for the lunch, but it did well in breakfast. So you probably have seen that on your breakfast menus as well. But you guys definitely liked that as well and it's doing really well in the breakfast sector. Zesty broccoli. Now see, I call this on the border. If you like broccoli, you're probably gonna like it. If you don't like broccoli, like it. <laughs> but it's doing very well for what it is. You guys definitely like the new, the new recipe and that is active currently on your menu. Candy carrots. Now this one's a little, this is the most that I didn't get uh, surveys back from. People just didn't try it. I got NAs and they said, I don't like candy carrots or I don't like carrots at all. So, but for those that you do, I actually liked it, and those that you don't, I got a lot of uh, don't like it ever, and then I don't like carrots. So that's what you got. And then, so we have started a menu planning team. Uh, the menu planning team consists of your cafeteria managers and staff, uh, ourselves at central office. I am a very, very small uh, percentage of our entire department that works very, very hard to put something that is good in front of you. Um, the parents are also an influence, and the most important is our customers, and that is you guys. You guys are the number one group of people that we look to to find out if you like what you're eating. Um, if you don't, we want to hear from you. 
Um, that is, like I said, that is my personal goal. I want to make sure that when you're going to lunch that you're excited about what you're about to eat. And if something is lacking, we want to know that. We want to know that there's something that you want. If you've got recipe ideas, please feel free to bring that information to us. And we don't, I mentioned before that everyone gets a free breakfast, a free lunch, and a free snack if you want it. And I want to make sure you want it. And the other part of it is, is we're not cutting corners. We're trying to bring you guys whole muscle chicken, your brand that you love. And currently, we have these brands served every day in your school. You may not see them in the, in the pack, it's not packaged. It's not packaged like that. <laughs> but these are, these are the brands that you have. Currently, every day, the chicken that you get, the sausage that you get, the juices that you get, the dressings that you get, the chips that you get. And how many people like nachos? Do you know we're doing, uh, did y'all like the walking taco? Do you remember that, the bag with the Tostitos? We're doing that with Doritos next month. So it'll be Doritos and queso. Tell your friends, don't know. I've ordered enough. But I just want to give you an idea of what it was. So in the whole thing of continuing with our samples, I got, a, I got these juices in. These were supposed to be at the point when uh, we were doing the samples for everybody, but they sent me one case with all flavors instead of one case per flavor, so we didn't have enough. But they got them today. So if I could have like maybe the first two rows of students, if you'll come up and grab one and try it, and then the rest of you guys, everyone will get one on your way out. So you'll just pick, you can pick one up. They are four ounce juices and fruit combination. So, well, yes, you can definitely have one. <laughs> we have enough for everybody, parents included. So if my, my group here, my distinguished guests and everybody wants one, we have enough for everybody. But I just wanted to, on behalf of the nutrition, on the nutrition staff, I want to thank you guys so much. You guys are important to us. Um, we want to make sure that you're in class, that your your bellies are full, and you are concentrating, and you can have the stuff that you really enjoy. Eating. So that's it for me.
if you go onto the school system app, under the, I want to say directory, you go under the directory, where it says Clayton County Public Schools, first person you can email would be the superintendent. So there's no reason for you to have a question and not get it to me. And I promise I will respond to your email. Maybe at 3 in the morning, but I will respond to your email. Okay? So if you have a question for me, feel free to email me. But it's been a great, a great year with the student advisory. Hopefully, hopefully we'll see who are our seniors? Who are our seniors? Our seniors in here? Let's stand up. Stand up, seniors. Stand up, seniors. Now, you all have got to give a great shout out to our seniors. And so, seniors, we know you're graduating in May. We would just hope that you would come back when we have future student advisories. And you all, I know you'll be in college and, and doing life. But don't forget while you're doing life to come back and participate in our advisories. You promise? Yes. All right, we appreciate it. Let's give our seniors another round of applause. <laughs> Let's, I want all these teachers, counselors, all your sponsors that get you here, that got you here. I want you to stand up. All of the adults who are. Let's give out all Drop it in there. Okay? That being it, have I done?